Leesman? Don Leesman? <laughs> Where's Don Leesman? I hear him. There he is. I knew if I called him, he would show up. Donald, we're waiting. All right. You need to. It has to be all about Donald's entrance. Donald Eastman, friends. Donald Eastman. Hey. <laughs> all right. Hello. Hello, everybody. All right, welcome. Uh, my name is Gwendolyn Alper. I am the dramaturg for this event, uh, Evelyn Brown, A Diary. It's been a journey. Um, so I just want to welcome everybody to this talk back. Um, we've had two talk backs. The first one was last weekend, and just so you know, that was with the actors and our fabulous director, Alice Regan. That has just been posted on the La Mama website. So if you're interested, that is now available. So I encourage you to check that out. And I, resolve, I reserve the right that if you ask questions that were answered on that video, I'm going to just say watch the video. Is that fair? All right, but tonight we have a completely different situation where we have the fabulous designers for Evelyn Brown and um, two members of the original production team for Evelyn Brown at Diary when it first debuted in 1980 at Theater for a New City. So that is a very, we have a historic panel here tonight. So I'm going to introduce them. We will um, have some questions among ourselves. And then I know there's some really big brain Fornes people in the audience, so then we will hopefully open it up to you folks. So first I'm going to introduce directly to my right, Donald Eastman, who probably needs no introduction. Um, but he was uh, Irene's set designer for many years, and he's been with me since 2018, trying to get this puppy back up. Um, and he did design this beautiful set that you can see here today. So thank you so much, Donald, for doing and returning for Evelyn Brown. Um, next we have Gabriel Berry, who was Irene Gay. Gabriel was Irene's costume designer for many years, um, and also did the costume design for this revival of Evelyn Brown. Um, so thank you also for coming back to do this show. We are honored that you are here. Um, and I will note that their full bios as member of this um, cast and crew are in the digital program. So I'm not going to repeat them, but they are there if you want to see all the myriad things that they have done. And finally, to my far right is Peter Littlefield. Yay, Peter. And Peter did not work on this production of Evelyn Brown, but he was the original stage manager of Evelyn Brown in 1980. And I just want to say that Peter has been so generous, because I've been interviewing him since 2018, and he's kind of my go-to guy. I'm like, Peter, how many tables were there? What was going on? He's very generous with his time, and I want to thank him so much both for um, helping with the reconstruction project and also for showing up tonight and being very generous. Um, I'm gonna read a quick uh, bio of, of his because it's not in the digital program. Um, Peter Littlefield began his career with I Irene Fornes and never stopped learning from her. He's a playwright, stage director, stage director and dramaturg. He helped start the Pyramid Club Fun fact, I think I played in the Pyramid Club in the 1980s. You all remember the Pyramid Club? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> We've all been there. Uh, where he wrote and directed many shows. His work as a dramaturg includes The Mother of Us All at Glimmer Glass Opera, Peter Pan at the Fisher Center at Bard, and handles Partenope? Partenope. Partenope, sorry, I don't know the one, at the English National Opera. His adaptation... Fair enough. His adaptation of Dogtown Common, a poem about Gloucester, Massachusetts, which I'm from Massachusetts, so I do know how to pronounce that one. Um, Massachusetts Lore was recently performed there as part of its tetracentennial, centen centennial. So he is still a working artist very much in the Massachusetts theater community. Um, quick note about uh, timing and house staff. Our house staff are our Evelyn Browns, and we like to respect their time. Um, because they work diligently behind the scenes without the respect and you know financial remuneration that they deserve. So we're going to try to keep this to about a half hour, um, maybe 35 minutes, just so that they can get home and don't have to stay too late. Um, and so without further ado, and the other thing I'm going to say is we do need to use the mics. I know it's a little annoying, but it's because we are recording this and it will be live streamed. So prepare your questions, but know if you say a question, you too will be live streamed. All right, so first question to everybody, yes? When did you meet Irene, and what was the first show that you worked on with her? I know the answer for Donald, so I'm gonna 
Maybe I should go first. You go I met her first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's true. Um, I met I met Irene uh, 1974. I was working on. I was an assistant stage manager for the production of The Seagull, directed by Joe Chaikin, and the um, assistant director had agreed to to stage manage a production. Um, produced by New York Theatre Strategy, which Irene mm -hmm. ran, and she didn't want to do it. And so she mm -hmm. sent me her way. I'd never done anything like that before. I had to be taught how to call lights by the lighting designer. Um, but there was something about Irene. Um, I decided that she was the person I wanted to learn from. And I sort of became her slave for the next five years. <laughs> Except for the fact that she did everything with me. I mean, we cleaned out the Second Avenue Theatre before it was Theatre for the New City. Um, I've got a lot of stories um, with Irene. She was the most important person in my creative life. And I introduced Donald to her. Yes, Peter introduced me to Irene. Um, and the rest is history. And I introduced Gabriel to Irene. And then we brought a third in, Ann Militello, and we were the triumvirate. So when we were young, pretty, and talented. Um, hey. We're still pretty and talented. You're still. <laughs> but I, Irene really, when we had our little chit chat, first chit chat, she was questioning me about working, working hard. Am I afraid to work? It was all about that eth ethic. And I assured her that that was, I was there. Now I'm. Not so there. <laughs> Tired. <laughs> and what was your first show? I know the. It was answer. Evelyn Brown. It was Evelyn Brown. And it was interesting because Irene was had finished theater strategy, her company, but had a, a lot of the funds still remained. So she spent this is nineteen eighty sixteen hundred dollars on just set materials. That's a lot of money back in ninety. That was like. And we had these carpenters who were real carpenters. I don't know where they came from. Some were up north, I think. And they built it like a house. And uh, it had 14 doors. Wow. And I'm a literary door, doors. How many doors do we have? One, three. two, three, four, five. Okay. <laughs> With George Bartania and I went looking and for And me too. Doors. It was a great time because everyone in the Upper East and West Sides are all renovating. You know, everyone is getting their, 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 their you know, pre-war building is redone. See, we drive at night in George's station wagon, and in front of almost every big apartment, there was just doors, 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 doors. <laughs> we just shove them in the back, wow. brought them all downtown, and then it's kind recycling. of put my sense together on what door goes where. Yeah, it was, it was something else. Yeah, we had to buy doors now. We couldn't recycle them. And That's why made, we have less we doors. Made we made doors. the doors. So. And I'm very thrilled with what happened here, because uh, it's similar to the spirit. And uh, it looks pretty good. It's great. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, our lighting is, is kind of beautiful. Like Christine yeah. Watanabe, yeah. she has the spirit. There's only like three lights in the front of the theater, and that's always a good sign. Mm -hmm. And then I introduced Irene to Gabriel. And here we go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, pull it up a little? Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> Irene had originally done the costumes for Evelyn Brown, and Irene was perfectly co comfortable doing her own costumes, and I'm not even sure why she brought me in, because Donald recommended me, I think, because I did not get grilled, I just got taken on, and the piece that we started out was A Visit, which was her retelling of sort of the Dwardian pornography of the beautiful young cousin who comes to stay in the country house with the, you know, the baron and his wife and the young son and the maid and the gardener and she has sexual encounters with all of them. Now, at this point, Irene was doing preliminary previews of these shows out in California at Padua Hills. So she had done this and while she was there, she had had this wonderful uh, ceramicist, whose name I can't, I don't know, make little beautiful erect porcelain penises for all the men and porcelain breasts for all the women. And so they were in a constant state of erection. And, but then 
I just sort of, I grabbed ride with just a bunch of old lace and things. And me and Irene would just, Florence Tarlow was in this production, and she was a wonderful old actress who I was just talking about earlier today. And um, hold this for me. Sure. Um, she had a generous bosom. <laughs> I mean, I have a generous bosom, but nowhere. <laughs> nowhere you talk about. And I had, you know, ridiculous things like doilies and tablecloths. And me and Irene just sort of draped them on her bosom. And I don't know how we got costumes out of that, but we did. <laughs> and uh, that was forever my way of dealing with Irene, arrive with a bunch of stuff and see what happens. And one note on that was the costume designer that's listed in the Evelyn Brown program is named Monica Lorca, oh, yeah. which was Irene's alter ego that she created so that she could have an entire career as a costume designer named Monica Lorca, who was a little known relative of the famous playwright, Spanish Lorca, if you know what I'm going with that. Um, and I remember when we started, Alice was like, no, Irene didn't do the costumes for Evelyn Brown, it was Monica Lorca. I was like, I know, that was, that was Irene. So it's kind of a fun little fact there. All right, you guys have started talking about this a little bit, but I want to talk a little bit more about your process of collaboration with Irene um, as designers and how she kind of worked with you in the room or any particular productions that come to mind. Oh, boy. Uh, Almost every show I did with Irene, it wasn't written when we started. Huh. She was working on something, had things. She never handed me. I, I got a script once uh, for Abington Square. Uh, and I went, oh, Irene wrote a play. Cool. <laughs> it was always everything about kind of what it was or the world it was or the world it was. And I have a feeling I was like part of her spark. Mm -hmm that you know, she kind of knew, now she has a picture of where this is taking place and, and will keep, keep writing it and rewriting it and rewriting it. So it was always interesting, but, but we always had a flavor, you know? And, uh, and it was always beautiful, it was always odd. Uh, there were certain things we did a lot. Uh, we, she always liked the space behind the space. Uh, in Sarita we had a high window, a high, uh, room that was floating up there. A visit was similar, the back wall opened and there was a elevated area that was a whole forest of tree, birch trees with red leaves. So it was always this, and wonderful, and I just dug in, you know, and, uh, and we always seemed to be well produced. There was always money. I think she always made that, sure of that when she signed that contract to do the, to direct and write. Um, and we kind of pulled off beautiful things. And, I mean, A Visit was a musical. Yes, it was a play with music. A Visit was a play with music, and she often collaborated with wonderful musicians. I was one of the happy moments of my life when I got to work with Tito Puente through uh, he doing music for one of her plays. My favorite thing in A Visit was the one song uh, that a friend, and some of you may know, Chris Tanner, he played the boy ingenue, and the song was called Red Ink. And it was a great little song, and it was basically the recipe for red ink. <laughs> very Irene, very found and elevated. Um, the only thing I can add to this is that when Irene talked about you, Donald, she would talk about your refinement, your aesthetic refinement. That was very inspiring to her. Well, we would get things figured out, and she goes, okay, now, Donald, it's time for you to do what you do. And I said, what's that? She goes, add the molding. <laughs> And you can explain that quote where you said her mother, Carmen, always called you the... She said, I read one day, her mother, uh, she said, I was talking to my mother this morning, and she asked me in Spanish, is the toy maker coming today? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to say anything else about the collaborative process with Irene? Well, I mean, with all due respect to both of you, who played a huge role in her career, Irene always felt that she designed her shows. Oh, yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> and she did, I mean, she, because she con conceived the whole thing. And, and also, the thing that you were saying about her script, you can't divide her scripts from her productions. Um, uh, she was, 
She was basically annoyed at Larry Kornfeld uh, for not understanding what she was trying to do with her plays, and she just decided that she was going to direct her own plays. But as she started to do it, she realized that there was a creative process in, in the making um, that you know, had, an, had an impact on the, on the script itself, on the, on the production itself. And um, I guess that's all I have to yeah, say. Yeah. Thank you. Go I have a good one to add. Yeah. My favorite story, and I don't know who told me, it might have been Irene, but how she started writing plays. She was in college, she was roommates with Susan Sontag. Oh, they were just roommates. Okay. And, yeah, come on. They, they were. Anyway, uh, Susan was, and I read, I read was like art, art, art focused. You know, two dimensional art focused, kind of fabric, just fabric patterns, and prints, and stuff like that. And uh, Susan was a little frustrated. She said, "Susan, what's wrong?" She was, oh, "I'm trying to write a play, but I just don't know how to begin." So Irene, classic Cuban dynamo. But well, wait a minute, Susan, how hard can it be? Come on, let's think about this. Okay, we have, some, we have a couple of people, and they're sitting in some sort of room, and they're discussing something. You know, perhaps maybe there's a conflict or something, but you know, and so I read, the more she was explaining how, how to write a play, which she'd never done before, she said, oh, I want to try that. <laughs> that was the spark. Irene, I don't know how to write a play. Well, uh, let me just explain it. <laughs> In other words, to show up Susan Sontag. That's what she said. Take on the job. Yeah, totally. Come on. Okay. It, um, if I remember correctly, the other thing that occurred in this session, this famous session, is that Irene set up some kind of a game. I can't remember what it was. She took a book from the shelf in the apartment once they were home. They were in a cafe. It wasn't college, a cafe. I mean, I've heard different versions of this story. Morgan's heard different stories. Scott's heard different versions of the story. But it's a famous story. They're sitting in a cafe, and Susan wanted to go to a party. And I was like, we have to go home and write. And Susan was like, no, I want to go party. She's like, no, we must be disciplined to go home and write. And then when they got back to the apartment, Irene said, it's easy. I'm going to pull a book off the shelf and pick the first word from this page. And that's the first word of the sentence. So it was a wordplay game. But Irene would often set up for herself uh, some kind of puzzle. Yeah. And, and it was a way of creating um, something objective outside herself in a sense, to trick herself into tumbling into the world that she's starting to generate. And um, it just gets at the way that Irene was both, you know, completely imaginative, but also very logical and practical about her process and how to do things. Very with her when she wrote Drowning? No. No, that was later. That was much later. There's also Mud. Mud, she loves swap meets. And especially in Southern California, when she would be there for the Padua Hills Festival. And the play Mud, which is a beauty, uh, came out of a, a little wood ironing board she found there. Mm -hmm. And she said, this inspired, this inspired it. And I said, Irene, it's, it's, it's so beautiful. And she said, it fell from heaven. <laughs> and it really did. Mud is like, yeah. or Evelyn Brown came from a, an actual diary. Uh, the Danube came from Hungarian mm -hmm. language. Le lesson language records. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was all this found at swap meets. And there were things in Evelyn Brown that were found also, like I stole all this uh, porcelain uh, oh. plates and, and so on from the Manhattan Theater Club. They, they had a, they had a, they had a, a ca the Bohemian Benevolent Society had a cafeteria and they had that really heavy kind of porcelain and, um, and the doors. Um, but I, I, I've talked to you about this, and I'll try to be very brief about it. But um, I, leading up to this piece, uh, leading up to Fefu and, and, and the Danube and Evelyn Brown, these, these pieces sort of in this little period, this, up to mud, let's say, Irene basically went through a process. When I first met her, she wasn't writing. And she, and she put herself through a, a very rigorous uh, um, process of, of reinventing herself. And she basically did it using the director's theater kind of techniques. Um, and and in the, in the, we spent long hours where she would kind of talk about relationships and what a car wreck they were. Because her earlier work, which was very clever um, and, and, and got, out, get, got out a lot of things, it was also kind of literary and it was a little bit derivative of the, the absurdist. And she set out a program for herself basically to um, 
break down her own inclinations in that direction mm -hmm. so that she could kind of fall into something more real and banal. Mm -hmm. and, and these shows, which, which, you know, there's a variety of them in relation to a script. Some are more generated directorially, more, um, are, the, are, are the result of that. And basically that took her for the rest of her career. And this is the only show that Irene ever did that comes completely from found text. She didn't write any of the words in this play. So you have a diary, which is all the, you know, January 1st, February, well, all those dates are from literally from the, di the diary. Then there were two other found texts that she incorporated, which is the uh, bread making scene recipe, and then the every kitchen needs a box. And those, uh, we believe, were found in like women's home journal magazines of the era in the early 20th century. So in a lot of her other plays, she would use found objects as inspiration, and then they would kind of settle in or become a small part. What's different about Evelyn Brown is she didn't actually write it, which is really fascinating because people think about her as a playwright, but this is really her directorial skills that are on display, right? Can I, can I say sure, one sure. thing about this? The greatest found object in Evelyn Brown was Margaret Harrington. Um, Ma Margaret was in her uh, playwriting class. She played uh, Evelyn. Yes. She, she was Evelyn, that's yeah. correct. She was. Um, Mar Evelyn. Margaret was in her playwriting class, and she asked her to read. They were doing auditions for a Rochelle Owens play. That was the first play that I worked on, directed by Larry Kornfeld, and, um, which was about a Chinese prince who turns into a princess. Um, and it was written for Jeff Weiss. Um, and Margaret starts reading people, and Irene just likes her feeling for words. And in the way of Irene, Irene's always looking for real things. Um, Margaret felt real to her. And she basically bullied Margaret into the role that Jeff Weiss was supposed to play. He couldn't play it. Um, and she gave a much different kind of performance. But then Margaret became her, her muse during this period of reinventing oh. Irene's uh, theatrical aesthetic. And it was all based on things that are plainer, things that are, that are, more, uh, that are not theatrical, um, things that, are, that, are, that pay a great deal of attention to the detail of things in life. And um, there, was a, there was a piece that preceded this piece uh, called Emma Gold. Well, actually, there are two it's versions. It's called Washing. Well, there, I, I could have this wrong, but if, if I remember correctly, Morgan. Washing, uh, Emma Goldman kind of turned into Washing. Yeah, I think it was um, But it washing. was basically a piece where Margaret is washing herself, and she goes through a sort of a process. But again, it was, not a, it was not a scripted piece. It was not a dialogue piece. It was a movement piece. And Irene was interested in the actuality of a person being in a situation. A thing, the thing about this piece that maybe is the biggest challenge for reproducing it is it really can't be acted. Mm -hmm. You have to find people, you have to find real people, susceptible people, and, the, and I think she learned this from the director's theater. You put them into a situation and then you see how they deal with it. And the whole business about the, the staging at the end with, with, the, with the tables and the, that, that's just, put these two people, Eileen Passoff was a dancer from uh, the, uh, the Judge and Dance Theater. They were quite different. Um, they, they sort of were almost like two different dimensions. They, 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 they liked each other, but they were kind of averse sides coming together, kind of. Um, and that, that, law, that last part of the, of the bringing out the tables and setting the tables, I mean, there's, there's something about just the day-to-day -day thing of a, of a cleaning, of a maid, you know, having to set the table. But it, it was also just to put them through that ordeal of doing it and, and seeing the effect on, on them. Yes, and while we have the actors still here, they're all, hello, can we see the actors? I just want to <laughs> first of all, I'm gonna ask I'm gonna ask Gabriel what it was like to costume these two beautiful actors before they leave so they can hear. And then I want to know if you folks have any questions for them because it might be useful for you to ask them questions, right? Yeah, so you think on that and Gabriel, what was it like to costume Violetta and Ellen? <laughs> 
Well, luckily, or unluckily, I've worked with them before, and um, I know and love them, and they know and they love me. So, uh, so it was always, uh, they were trusting because it's a real element of my style. If you don't trust me, your life is miserable. <laughs> Because I don't know what I'm going to be doing. Uh, so in this case, uh, the, we had pictures from Irene, and I also done a lot of research of you know farm women and domestics in the early 20th century, and so we knew we wanted the basic profile of, that Irene had portrayed in her production, and for me it was just uh, introducing color and texture. And um, Irene, for me, visually in costume, she was always playful. And she was very sensuous. And so it was all about, you know, touching Florence Tarallo's bosom. Uh, so I was, uh, I was definitely uh, just going with the flow, and we worked it out. And they're incredibly good sports. I mean, Anne Bogart has trained them to, or maybe it's Suzuki, they're, they're, they'll go along with most anything you ask them. And um, hopefully I didn't ask them anything too terrible. I, I love them. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions for these folks? You get, no, if we open up the house? Uh, just gratitude. And oh. to you, you are such a lovely, wonderful group. We got go through this. We yeah. Oh, I'm recording. Sorry. <laughs> I've been talking loud to you for an hour. Uh, just thank you. I think we all go through it together. I think it's not easy on you. And it's haunting and mysterious and you're, you're clawing for narrative or meaning or why, what is behind the door and when it opens, what is it? What does it mean? And um, and I think that that presence with us makes all the difference in the world in, in the event together. You know, it's yeah. just about the present together. What, what do we do? These little reckonings in small rooms in basements, um, keeping theater, this pulse going, uh, means the world to me. And to meet these people, I'm deeply grateful for what they've given us and also for the present for the grac graciousness to let us do this again and bring ourselves to it. And that, that's a lot for artists to give something up and give their work to us, to this generation, so, of which I'm very, very grateful. Um, and I will say this about Gabriel. I walk across hot coals to work with Gabriel Berry and those costumes are sneaky, right? They're sneaky. They're, they look very, oh yeah, that's a housekeeper, but they're, they're bright in a way and muted in a way, they move in a way, they're sexy in a way. I think they're, she is an astonishing designer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alan. So we can, I have many more questions, but they might go south. So I'm wondering if you folks had any questions before I ask another question. Peter, please describe the baking of the potato bread, how they did it. <laughs> Good question. I've gotten 25 different responses to that question. Is that for me? Yes. yes. I can't cook. No, how they did it in the original Evelyn Brown. How did they bake the bread on stage in the original? Well, they Evelyn didn't. Yeah. They didn't. You they... were the original stage master. I was. I was. So they didn't bake the No. No. They did more or less what happened tonight. They, 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 they the idea was to present the recipe. I mean, you know, th this is one of the things about the, the production, um, and I think uh, that Alice is true to it. Uh, nothing comes to an ultimate conclusion. N n nothing is trying to reproduce, um, you know, something the way it actually happens. Really, it seems to me that she's, again, in the way that she liked to play games, that she would set up a puzzle for herself and, and, and then, you know, subject herself to it. Evelyn Brown was a puzzle. And the puzzle, I would, the way I would describe the puzzle is you have a woman who's alone, 
she seems to signal, or a, a, a woman living in 19th century um, New Hampshire, how does she survive? How does she live? Um, she has to work. And in the course of working, she ekes out some space for herself, some dignity, some meaning. Um, but at the same time, there's a great deal of isolation, and there's just a tension between those things. That's the puzzle that Irene set out to do. And she, and she, you know, she chose two players, Margaret Hamilton, uh, Harrington, who, as I say, was Irene's muse. Irene actually focused on Margaret on her way to try to develop a theater that was more real. Um, and Eileen Pasloff, who was from uh, the Judson Dance Theater, which was about real movement, you know, folding and unfolding a chair over and over and mm. uh, into all kinds of different rhythms. And the, 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 the staging, with the, particularly with the tables and so on, but also the stuff up the hall um, where uh, Evelyn Brown is alone um, and, and Evelyn is speaking over the, you know, um, pre-recorded or whatever. That's all movement of, uh, inspired by the Judson um, Dance Theater. Um, yeah. And I'd like to keep going on this and ask Donald and you, Peter, what do you think of coming back to Evelyn Brown after 40 years? You're more as a spectator now. You're still on the casting crew. What's it been like to see it again 40 years later? It, it, I love it. It's been wonderful. Uh, our whole team, the whole team is wonderful and sweet and, and beautiful. And Alice rocked it. I have to say that. Mm -hmm. Alice Reagan. <laughs> For all the reasons Peter said, uh, she jumped in and solved, tried to solve the Chinese puzzle. Right. right. You know, pushing the blocks around. And it is what it is. Do you want to see it now that you've seen it tonight? Do you have any response of what it was like? I'm kind of curious, like, what would Irene have thought? <laughs> what would Irene have thought about this production, Peter? Clearly, you don't know Irene's mind, but I'm curious to ask you that question. You shouldn't. Um, it's really more a conversation to have with Alice, you know, with you, with to talk about it. With Irene. Um, Irene was a, a unique creature, and she dug into the elemental in a way that... Um, you know, is not explicable to the um, average middle-class person. And um, I, I thought that the piece really did, um, did justice to um, her piece and what she was trying to do. Um, there's an element of risk or danger um, of, um, uh, what's the, uh, the word? Um, for instance, like, like the movement around the table. Mm -hmm. That was really odd mm -hmm. in Irene's version. And um, be, because it came out of Irene in some odd way. I, I, you can't reproduce that. Um, the thing about, um, they weren't acting in that production. Mm -hmm. they, they were just Margaret with her feeling for language and Eileen with her feeling for movement. And something raw, come, you know, in a way you'd have to, do your own, you have to get your own, you have to get the diary and do your own version um, to get as close to that because there's just a, something existential in the risk that goes into creating something uh, like that from scratch. Um, but I, I still thought it was very beautiful and I, I was moved by the end. And, um, you know, I probably was a little resistant, the old fogey, well, you know, it's not Irene. Um, but by the end, I, I, I felt like I'd been through something. I felt, I felt the drudgery of the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. But those two ladies had an escape. Those two ladies right. had an escape, eventually. Mm -hmm. Even drudgery was better than that escape. Mm -hmm. What I want, would have done, I would have brought a nice old pitcher of iced tea, it would have been poison. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. But, but I love what they, they had their escape, mm -hmm. and they chose even that, even mm -hmm. that life is better than no life at all. Mm -hmm. Wendell, I love it. Why is there no New England accent? 
in the narration. Why is it a New the York question accent? Why is there no and New England no accent? New England accent? Why, no would New there England accent? why would there be? There's no accent. Yeah, right. there's no accent. We talked about doing it, and we dispensed with the idea. It's a woman in New England. What? Yeah. We, but, did, we did talk about doing it, and the actors and I decided no. I can tell you that there was no I mean, New say England Alice accent. And I talk, they talked about it, but then it's not against it. I think it's more of an every woman situation. It, that would be too specific. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the big changes that I redid is made Evelyn Brown two people so that it was no one person. It's not that specific. It's about broadening Evelyn Brown to be more than one specific person. That's the impulse of what Irene's intervention was with the character. So to make her more specific was not the spirit of the play. And there was no New England accent in the original, I can no, tell you. There that. were no accents. The two actors were not from New England. You can't get an accent from a diary, anyway. Yeah, well, they actually went up there. They did actually well, go up to Melbourne, New Hampshire, and they did research the accent, but they didn't put it in the play. So we don't have too much more time, but can we get maybe one more question from the audience? Anybody else have a question? Scott, Morgan, hello, nobody. That's it. <laughs> No, I'd just like to say that I saw something on one of the women that was like an image from a piece of poetry. It was a it was an expression with her mouth. And I write, and I do write sometimes kind of um, very surreal images, and I saw that. First I saw a grimace, then I saw a yawn, and then I saw a scream. She was crying for help. And, and, and was there anything in particular that that image was supposed to define? Or is that the way I'm reading it, like you would read an image in a piece of poetry? Everybody would read the poem and have a different version. So in the script, it does, just says grimace and shake. Those are the stage directions. So we practice that a lot. Um, and you know, ultimately, it was Violetta and Alice in conversation about what those meant. But um, Alice can chime in here, but I think it's partly about letting you have your own interpretation of what that means. I don't think it's that that grimace means a definitive thing, That's right? I so I, I think yeah. it's more about this intensity of emotion against this very flat script that then the audience can take away what they will, right? All right, um, we need to wrap it up pretty soon, but any more questions from the audience? Or is there anything else you want to ask each other? No? Any we final questions? We just want to say thank you for doing this for us. Yes. Yes, I will echo that. Thanks Thank so much for coming. Yes, go ahead. I have a question for Peter. Why are there two actors? <laughs> um. <laughs> I think that they represent two sides of experience in anybody's psyche, you know, and uh, the split. And that tension is always there in the production. Irene always said, she would say, I have these two women, when we were f figuring it out, and she said, there's Margaret, and Margaret's like ethereal. And she was, then I have Eileen, who's earthbound, and so there you go. But they both deliver the script equally the same. Mm -hmm. and, and also, as the production uh, progresses, the split increases. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have one person on the stage and you have the voice of the other person right. yes. in, the, in the heavens. And you have to yeah. <laughs> Pretty darn clever, huh? <laughs> all right. But unfortunately, that's about all the time that we have. So thank you so much for coming. And thanks so